And did you come well. yesterday already? Yesterday evening. Yeah. Yesterday yeah. evening. Yeah. So you have an impression from Leipzig. It's your first time here in, in Leipzig? Oh no, no, no not, not at all. all. No. Diana has recently published an extremely interesting book entitled Beyond Balkanism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, somewhat enigmatic <laughs> title. Can you elaborate a bit? Well, what uh, your intention was? Uh, going beyond uh, something. Uh, yes, Balkanism <coughs> is a, actually it's quite an old term. Um, it first emerged in the sphere of linguistics in the first half of the 19th century, explaining the linguistic convergences between morphologically unrelated languages in the, in the Balkans. Like Turkish, South Slavic languages, South Slavic, Romans, Balkan Romans, Greek, uh, and, and so on. And actually signifying precisely the opposite of fragmentation, which is the connotation of the current notion of volcanism, namely uh, similarity and, and convergence. But as a term in the contemporary um, scholarly vocabulary, and especially one related to the sphere of uh, symbolic geographies, production of space, um, rationale for for uh, existence of regions and all other uh, supranational spaces. This term emerged in the 1990s um, and was re-signified by Maria Todorova as an uh, offspring, an affiliated concept to Orientalism, however not synonymous with Orientalism. Um, even though sharing a lot of a lot of generic features with it, rather as a term that signified uh, the Western discourse about the Balkans, which emerged at the end of the 90th, or rather the beginning of the of the of the, and mostly at the beginning of the 20th century, as a discourse of othering within Europe, as different from Orientalism, which is othering outside. outside outside of Europe. That is to say, uh, the Balk Balkanism as a discourse which is deterritorialized. Und dieser Vortrag vor mir beweist es sehr deutlich, dass wir Hinterhof Europas äh, sind. Die Frage, die sie stellt, ist immer, ob das wirklich unser Nachteil ist, das weiß ich noch nicht. Wir haben diesen Sehnsucht, wir arbeiten daran hart, äh, aber wenn man das zu bedenken gibt, wie viel vor uns steht und was wir noch zu tun haben. In meinen Augen wird es nicht leicht. Diana Mischkova is Professor of Modern and Con Contemporary History um, uh, and Academic Director of the Center for Advanced Study SOFIA, abbreviated CAS. She is probably the most internationally connected Bulgarian scholar in the field of the humanities. Among else, she is foreign corresponding member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences and since recently Dr. Honoris Causa of Södertörn University in Sweden. I add that she has particularly close ties to German academia, having been among else fellow of Wissenschaftskolleg zu Berlin, of Imre Kertes Kolleg in Jena and Historisches Kolleg in München. On the CAS website she has identified as her areas of specialization the following modern and contemporary history of Eastern Europe, contemporary com comparative history of European <coughs> nationalism, modernization of Southeast European societies, history of modern political ideas, European intellectual history, conceptual history, historiography and theory of history and methodology of comparative historical research. Yet looking at her long list of publications, quite a number of additional fields come to one's mind, like how the decades of communist rules are remembered in present day Bulgaria, how historians construct European mesoregions, or how narratives of medieval empires 
shape historiographies in the post-Byzantine realm until today. Before I turn to Diana Mishkova's most recent monograph to which the title of tonight's lecture refers, let me say a few words on the eminent significance of CAS, the Center for Advanced Study Sofia, founded by her in 2000. CAS is one of the very few independent research institutions in Bulgaria in the field of the humanities and social sciences with a strong international and interdisciplinary orientation. It attracts young talents and outstanding senior scholars by offering institutional conditions conducive to free pursuit of knowledge and dialogue in the framework of individual research fellowships or collaborative multidisciplinary and cross-cultural inquiries. Of the current and former staff of our institute, for example, Jan Zofka, Augusta Dimu, Gilad Benun, myself, and others probably have in the past indeed been attracted. In partnership with other institutes of advanced study, universities, scholarly and cultural associations, CAS works to re-establish the tradition of intellectual communities and to facilitate open critical debate and exchange of people and ideas on national and transnational levels. As Diana's colleague at the center, the economic historian Roman Avramov told me concerning this national Bulgarian level, there is also something like a hidden agenda of CAS which perceives itself as a brain gain institution against brain rain, and I quote Ruben Abramov. We are convinced that by providing a distinct, unique ambience and milieu, we contribute indirectly but efficiently to the deep parochialization of the Bulgarian scholarly community and to the adoption of the highest research standards. We find it very important that within CAS, the Bulgarian scientists feel completely immune to career considerations or to pressures from the academic establishment. Those are powerful tools of in, in imposing conformism. Unquote, no comment, I think, necessary. Since its establishment in 2000, CAS has implemented some 20 international interdisciplinary research projects, supported 350 fellows from 30 countries and 70 universities in Europe and the US. The overall funding is secured mostly from renowned European and American scholarly foundations and institutions. Since this year, for the first time, also the Republic of Bulgaria here, the Ministry of Education and Science contributes to CAS fellowship program. As I mentioned, the title of Diana's speech tonight, How the Balkans Came to Be, A Look from the Inside, refers to her recent monograph, Beyond Balkanism, the Scholarly Politics in Region Making, published some months ago by Routledge. Here she turns the perspective of Maria Todorova's seminal study, Imagining the Balkans of 1997, in several ways around. First, she looks at how the Balkans looked at the outside world. Second, how the Balkans looked at themselves, in both cases with a focus on academic milieus. And third, how scholars, not travelers, writers, politicians, journalists, and others, how scholars outside the Balkans looked at Europe, Europe's southeastern part, not the least in Germany and especially in Leipzig. Um, by the way, in 2003, we had Maria Todorova, whom I mentioned, um, uh, deliver our annual Haletsky lecture. Speaking of Haletsky, who of course, figures prominently in Diana's book. 
His integral concept of what he calls East Central Europe is in so far exceptional as it includes next to the Baltic countries, <coughs> Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, and so on, um, also all of the Balkans um, uh, due to their Christian Byzantine heritage. And speaking of Leipzig, Leipzig University is in the book identified as the role model for the emerging academic environments of Bulgaria and Romania in the late 19th century with scholars here in Leipzig like the Slavicist August Leski or the Romanist Gustav Weigand as luminaries. <coughs> but also Leipzig's specific role as a center of research on the Balkans in Nazi Germany is mentioned with figures like the historian Georg Stadtmüller, who after 1945 made a second career at Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. In other words, this is a multifaceted book which can be strongly recommended not only to Balkanists and South Europe, Southeast <coughs> Europeanists, but also to a whole array of others, specialists in area and transregional studies, in intellectual history, in processes of spatialization, and even to scholars dealing with the history of Leipzig and its university. I am sure that the lecture we are going to hear now will prove this judgment right. Let me conclude with a very short and very Balkanist quotation by the Greek surrealistic poet Nikos Engunopoulos who in his collection, The Return of the Birds of 1946, um, uh, stated, and I quote him in English translation, this is no fun and games. This is the Balkans. <laughs> Jana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stefan, for this extremely generous introduction. Now, um, I have many reasons to feel very honored to be, to be here tonight. Um, above all, obviously, in personal terms, uh, for being asked to act as a speaker in such a high-profile event to such a competent audience in the history and culture of Eastern Europe. But secondly, because I take it as a recognition for the, um, for the field which I'm plowing, which I'm um, working on for, for some decades now, and more broadly for the intellectual value and relevance of doing Balkan studies. I also take it as a sign of the vibrant regional commonality that an ambassador of, a, um, of a, another Balkan country, different from my own, is here tonight to remind us of the um, topicality uh, of the Balkans as a region, still as a region and not just as a cluster of, uh, of, national, of national cases. Well, as uh, Stefan Trups uh, just mentioned um, at the center of my recent research, um, over the last one decade at least, um, have been the understandings of the Balkans that have emerged from within the region itself, specifically, and this is very essential, from academically embedded discursive practices and political usages. My insistence on the importance of the scientific knowledge in the construction of the Balkans as an entity springs not simply from its omission in the discussions of the Western Balkanist discourse. 
while we can easily grant that compared to media, travelogues, and fiction, the main production sites of public Balkanism, scholarship plays a lesser role as a channel of disseminating intercultural images and that scholarly discourse obeys rules that restrict overt political ideological implications, it nevertheless performs the critical function of providing the resources for legitimization and empowering political discourses. After all, knowledge as power is taken to be a natural consequence of the inability of the Orient and the Balkans to create its own, its own self-representation. I must admit that much of the driving force behind this um, uh, interest of mine and sustained, uh, sustained interest have been certain dissatisfaction with the omission precisely of the academic scholarly discourses from uh, the discussion of the Western Balkanist uh, discourse in sharp contrast to the situation uh, with uh, the discussions of the Orientalist, uh, Orientalist paradigm. Ideally, then, one should consider in parallel an interaction both extra-regional and inter-regional expert conceptualizations of the Balkans. This I had tried in the book that, that uh, Stefan Trups briefly uh, presented. Uh, but for the sake of this lecture, let me only briefly sketch some aspects of the external expert engagement with the region and in the course of the subsequent expose, detect certain connections or dis disjunctions with the local discourses so as to pinpoint to the possible uh, communication, dialogue, or opposition between internal and external concepts and understandings of the Balkans. Scholarly interest in the Balkans as a distinct geographical and cultural area, and even its perce perception and naming as a single region, does not predate the early 19th century. The geographical notions of the Balkan Peninsula, the Balkans, and Southeastern Europe were late coinages of non-local, that is, non-regional origin, whereas the dominant appellation until almost the end of the 19th century was a political one. Turkey in Europe, or European Turkey, associated not so much with a fixed territory as with the geopolitical implications of the so-called Eastern question. The institutionalization of the study of the Balkans, both inside and outside the region, came about in the late 19th century and early 20th century, along with the ultimate disintegration of the Ottoman Empire. In the constitution of Balkan studies as a distinct academic field, scholars from the Habsburg realm and Austrian Volkskunde in particular played the, lead the leading role. At the turn of the 20th century, Vienna was the major European center for research in Balkan languages, ethnography, history, and culture. The German interest in the region built on a pre-existing notion of Middle Europa, formulated in the eight, already in the 1840s, where the vision of a strong Central Europe already included the Balkan Peninsula as a German sphere of interest. Its ramifications, however, were at different removes from the centers of power. Germany was, the for, was at the forefront of the institutionalization of Byzantine studies as an autonomous and rigorous scholarly discipline at the end of the 19th century, as well as of Ottoman studies, which until after World War II were dominated by German-speaking and Hungarian scholars. Not only did the systematic and inclusive conception of Byzantine and Ottoman studies encompass the whole Balkan Peninsula, but they approached the research field of Southeastern Europe from the other side, from the point of view of Constantinople or Istanbul, for which the Southeast was the Northwest. This was a significant shift of perspective in itself which also was capable to counterbalance 
the one-sidedness of the Central European point of view. Along with Vienna, one should note, as Stefan Tropps did, the central role of Leipzig in promoting comparative Balkan linguistics, folklore, and ethnography around the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. Almost all Bulgarian philologists and ethnographers in the period before the First World War were students of the Leipzig-based Slavist August Leskin and the linguist Gustav Weigand, whereas almost all prominent Serbian historians before and after the war were trained at the University of Vienna. French and British scholarly input was by far less systematic and formative of Balkan studies. The French academic approach to Le Balkan was shaped mainly by fears of the pan-German economic and political thrust in the area. This explains the French preoccupation with the South Slavs who were portrayed as the moral, political and racial opposite as well as strategic counterforce to the Germans. British attention to the region as well was provoked above all by the German and Russian expansion, Ottoman decay and political crisis. Most of the British Balkan experts were liberals who advocated the elimination of imperial rule and the erection of independent nation states as the only remedy to the problems of the Balkan nations. For Russia, on the other hand, studying the Balkan religious and ethnic brethren meant not only extending Russian influence in the region, but bolstering Russia's historical consciousness, Slavic identity, an imperial status in a context where such ambitions increasingly linked to obsession with the glories of antiquity. The emphasis it put on Slavo-Byzantine studies signified the close linkage of Russia's interest in Balkan history with contemporary Russian imperial identity. Up until the Second World War, extra-regional academic perspectives continued to tap into geopolitical and imperial projects, and the tendency to treat the Balkan or Southeastern European states en bloc had, as a rule, political and economic incentives. Discrete national academes, however, participated with different weight and proficiency in such conceptualizations. On the whole, whereas proximity and imperial expansion ensured the almost uninterrupted German political and economic involvement in the area. German language scholarship contributed most to the extensive and painstaking study of the region and the stabilizing of the Balkans and or Southeastern Europe as a historical region. For the better part of the pre-Second World War period, the British interest in the area was aligned to the framework of the Near East, which put the whole Balkan problematique in a specific light. However, the relationship between imperialism or strategic interest and academic engagement was not necessarily a straightforward one. While the larger British, French, American and German geopolitical stakes determined to a great extent, to, to a great extent the scale of academic investment, Italian upfront imperialist pursuits in the region in the interwar period, particularly, failed to engender academic interest, whereas Russian imperial cartography operated with various configurations, the Slavic world, the Balkans, or a satellite, Eastern Europe. Now, within the region, we can analytically distinguish four periods of academic regionalization. It is quite significant that the first regional self-representations emerged as parallel identity projects amidst the dynamic phase of European nation-state building. The period of the ultimate dismantling of, the, of Turkey in Europe at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries, which was marked by radicalization of national discourses, also saw the inception of an encompassing Balkan and Southeast European entity. Nation building and the construction of an overarching regional unity at the time went hand in hand and were compatible. 
Different disciplines participated with different weight in creating Balkan regionality and in defining its attributes. In the origin of the Balkans as a unitary notion, the then vanguard comparative linguistics played a key role. Today, the Balkan linguistic area or linguistic league, Balkan, Balkan Sprachbund, is considered as the first area of contact-induced language change to be identified as such, and as the model prototype for language interaction and convergence. Linguists were the first to use the term Balkanism to indicate, contrary to the present-day resignification of the term, the opposite of fragmentation, namely a lexical and more importantly grammatical feature shared among the unrelated or only distantly related languages of the Balkans. Balkan Slavic, Balkan Romance, Albanian, Greek, the Balkan Turkish dialects. Such morphological similarities among the Balkan languages, which were first observed by the Habsburg philologist Yernei Kopitar and Franz Miklosic, came to be increasingly interpreted as testimony to centuries of multilingualism and interethnic contact at the most intimate levels. The linguistic approach to the Balkans stirred other academic fields to turn their attention to phenomena like contact, interaction, and convergence. <coughs> According to Nikolai Yorga, Romania's foremost historian before the Second World War, regional history revealed a number of similarities strikingly reminiscent of the Balkan Linguistic Union. Yorga postulated the existence of a fundamental unity resting on archaic traditions, a particular culture and heritage common to the whole European Southeast. It was said to draw upon the great Thracoilian Roman tradition, to have been epitomized by Byzantium and later the Ottoman Empire, and enshrined in a wide range of common institutions. On their part, literary scholars like the Bulgarian Ivan Shishmanov and Bujan Penev or the Romanian Ioan Bogdan charted massive ethnographic, folkloric, and literary borrowings that undermined the romantic notion of national uniqueness and shaped a space of cultural osmosis based on long-standing coexistence and in interaction. The commonalities on the level of grammar, syntax, belief, and popular law, in turn, seemed to imply an underlying primeval unity in the way of thinking, mentality, and the unconscious. This trend evolved contemporaneously with the upsurge of the psychological discourses and the disciplines of comparative folk psychology and national <coughs> characterology. The notion of a Balkan mentality was one of its, of its outcomes, whose diffusion, however, was not due, as it is commonly claimed, to dubious academic fashions external to the region that tended to portray the Balkan cultures as a sanctuary of patriarchal practices and lifestyles long extinct elsewhere in Europe. It was the Serbian anthropogeographer Johan Zvic who, at the beginning of the 20th century, for the first time implemented this scientific psychological approach to the Balkans, to be later, to be later taken aboard <coughs> and away by Fernand Brodel, elaborating on the link between the mental constitution of populations and geographic factors. The interwar period, and this is the second phase in the involvement of the Balkans as a unitary concept, saw the rise of new paradigms promoting ontological and cultural morphological models for explaining spatial similarities and differences. They were less concerned with interaction and diffusion between nations, so characteristic of the previous period, than with devising some common cradle and shared structures for, structures for these societies. That was the aim of the so-called at the time new science of Balkanology, whose drivers were several Yugoslav and Romanian scholars. 
The time has come, wrote the editors of the Belgrade-based new journal, Revue Internationale des, des, des Etudes Balkaniques, to contemplate the coordinating of national academic Balkan studies, giving them cohesion and, above all, orienting them towards the study of a Balkan organism that constituted one whole since the most distant times, and elucidating the elements of Balkan interdependence and unity. And that was a quote. The major forces of Balkan aggregation, as they called it, were found to be the Macedonian dynasty, the Romans, the Byzantine Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. Significantly, the role of the Turks in imposing social, political, and mental cohesion on the whole region was seen as the most salient. At a time when the national historiographies were busy eliminating the Ottoman features from the national cultures, scholars of the Balkans endeavored to reverse the notion of the region as the Ottoman legacy in Europe. They did so not by asserting an inherent difference from the Ottomans, but by inverting and even praising the Ottoman primitiveness and the segregation of the Christians under Ottoman rule as prerequisites for the preservation and development of the unique Balkan virtues and potential. The tacit implication of this kind of argument was that had the Turks been more advanced, that is to say, more like the West, the culture and identity of the Balkan Christians would not have survived. This reading differed substantially from that informing the contemporary Western writings, which continued to describe the Ottoman rule as aberration and unmitigated disaster, a black yoke which was held responsible for all ills that plagued the development of the Balkan states. In this regard, the Western scholars of the Balkans found themselves in the same camp with the Balkan nationalists, not the Balkan regionalists. Even more remarkably, Balkan regionalists considered the idea of nationhood as a misplaced importation that brought about the disruption of an organic society. The principle of nationality and, the later, and later the right to self-determination, Romanian medievalist Victor Papacostia wrote, has not found in our area the right time and the right solution created in the West and for the West, the idea of national states was borrowed, or was borrowed by or enforced on the Balkans. No attempt was ever made to adapt this idea to the conditions of our region. It is hard to find another example in world history that reveals more clearly the catastrophic <coughs> consequences of the blind application of an idea in disregard for the major natural realities." End of quote. So, against the tendency of framing the Balkans in terms of nationalist discord, Balkan regionalists underscored the unnaturalness of and the difficulties nationalism encountered in the region. Such a view, predictably, was unpopular outside the region. Arnold Toynbee was one of the very few in the West who shared the view that the application to the intermixed populations of the Balkans and the whole Near East of the utterly exceptional Western formula of making language the basis for political demarcation had resulted in huge human suffering and massacre and, as he put it, diminishing returns in happiness and prosperity. From such positions, Balkan regionalists developed the theoretical and methodological parameters of the new science of Balkanology. Its domains outline a truly interdisciplinary study field, from history, linguistics, and folklore, to anthropology, demography, statistics, and human geography, to economic development, law, the arts, architecture, and literature. It is indeed remarkable that a genuine blueprint for what would come to be called area studies after the Second World War aimed at total knowledge by combining the humanities and the social sciences originated in the 1930s in the region itself. On the symbolic level, the shift was no less stunning. 
precisely at the time when the Western discourse of Balkanism saw its peak, when, as Maria Todorova put it, the Balkans became increasingly recreated as an abstract demon and the ultimate internal European other, in the local regional context, the term Balkans and being Balkan underwent systematic rehabilitation and veritable thriving as both a political and cultural concept. The movement towards a Balkan conference and Balkan pact, the founding of Balkan institutes to conduct Balkan research, the appeals for a Balkan fatherland and Balkan patriotism converged in the slogan, the Balkans for the Balkan peoples as a new political concept and in explicit opposition to Southeastern Europe, which was found to be an artificial and faceless coinage. This forceful rearticulation was aimed not at transcending the Western Balkanism, but at directly confronting and emasculating it. Next to laying the grounds of a new study field, interwar Balkanologists sought to resignify the Balkans and turn its Orientalist semantics on its head through a series of parahistorical statements about a primeval and essentially unchangeable Balkan soul, regenerated Balkan culture, a proper cultural orientation and global mission, regional self-reliance and self-sufficiency. The Balkans they tried to promote was not just a cultural, historical, and, soci and socio-economic entity, but an axiological category, one that embodied a particular value system underwired by cultural and moral elements. This exceeded coping with stigma and overturning self-stigmatization. Interwar academic Balkanism strived to supply the conceptual toolkit and the authoritative scholarly basis for the construction of a Balkan identification. While not denying the still persisting power of the nation state, it pursued a more encompassing, regionally anchored collective identity. In the process, the Balkans gelled, gelled into a discrete civilizational sphere occasionally underpinned by overt racism and couched in moralizing oratory or metaphysical, even mystic references. Ironically, this representation borrowed heavily from the then fashionable ethno-ontological discourse praising authenticity, organicity, and autarky. At heart, however, the interwar Balkan idea was an emancipatory one. It was an attempt at offsetting the impotence of small statehood in the geopolitical, geopolitical ambience of the 1930s. To protect the Balkans as one entity, to preserve it for the Balkan peoples themselves, wrote the founders of Balkansky Institute in Belgrade. This today is the only true and the greatest national idea. Our patriotism, if it wants to be real, should be a Balkan patriotism. End of quote. Furthermore, the Balkan idea as conceived at that time lifted the compulsion to choose and define the identity of the Balkans between the poles of Europe and Asia. It asserted the existence of a strong and irreducible Balkan individuality, which valorized in betweenness, liminality, and complexity in stark contrast to the Western Balkanist discourse. It sought to subvert the Western notion of progress where different communities trod towards the pinnacle of history occupied by the West. It professed a proper Balkan time axis leading from the deepest past to the present and future, where universal ancient vir virtues, the bedrock of European civilization, were continuously reenacted. Accordingly, the Balkan other was reimagined as the West's anthropological utopia, as the Westerner's alternative or possible self. He or she appeared as considerably more gifted, more admirable, and even more appealing than the average banal Westerner. It is worth noting, by the way, that such self-representation tallied with a conspicuous strain in Central European and Western literature at that time that aestheticized 
Balkan underdevelopment, spontaneity and artlessness. Arguably, this convergence of perspectives was the outcome not of imitation, but of a flow of ideas and concepts between East and West. The common intellectual context where this took place and which brought together thinkers, thinkers as different in other respects as the German Slavist Gerhard Gesemann, British historian Robert Sitton Watson, and Spanish philosopher Ortega <coughs> Gasset, was one shaped by civilizational anxiety and unease with what they defined as the moral poverty of the West. They all saw in the pristine Balkans a way of exploring the contemporary challenges to the self-assurance of the West and expressing the widely shared feeling of estrangement from modern life. From this perspective, engagement with the Balkans, both inside and outside the region, was a way of engaging with wider domestic and transnational debates about the fate of Western modernity and progress. After World War II, the Balkans as a political notion <coughs> all but disappeared. Nor was it considered a discrete economic region such as Eastern or Western Europe. It survived as a cultural historical space plowed by a cluster of historically oriented human sciences and as a terrain for exercising the soft power of cultural diplomacy. The proliferation of regionalist organizations and the consolidation of Balkan studies as an autonomous field in the 1960s brought together cultural politics, geopolitics, and national propaganda and marked a new wave of politicization of Balkan research. The major themes organizing the Balkanist academic discourse during those years were ethnogenesis and ethnocultural continuity, the impact of empires, the sources of backwardness and modernization, and relations with Europe. They were approached from strongly normativist positions marked by evolutionism, <coughs> Eurocentrism, and teleological thinking. Unlike their predecessors, the post-war Balkanists showed no enthusiasm for devising a Balkan road to modernity. The new Marxist dependency, world economy, and co-periphery paradigms also did not produce visible resonance in our region in contrast to other parts of Eastern Europe. The same applied to contemporary nationalism studies. The dominant Telos-driven approach to modernization besieged comparisons of the local stages of development with those in the capitalist West, rather than with the socially and economically deviant neighbors or other peripheries. As a general rule, regional scholars tended to stress particular aspects of the common Balkanness where their nation could claim special contribution. The periods that in theory featured as crucial for the Balkan historical unity were compartmentalized in similar national chunks. It was common to offer selective Bulgarian, Serbian, or Romanian perspectives to the Byzantine Empire, employing a deliberately ethnicized concept of folk and culture, or to parcel the study of the Ottoman Empire into Bulgarian, Byz uh, Serbian, or Greek lands within theological national narratives. Balkan studies were, in this sense, a virtual playground of methodological nationalism. Not surprisingly, the regional approach, this kind of regional approach, did not affect the writing of national history, which remained a self-contained didactic and parochial field. Remarkably, communication across the Iron Curtain was made possible precisely by the consensually shared national framework of history writing and by neither side putting the national paradigm under critical scrutiny. The Southeast European Journal in the United States regularly published thematic issues devoted to key national anniversaries featuring the diehards of the Balkan national historiographies. Albeit less con consistently, the same was true of Zydos Forschungen. The historical Balkans thus, thus came to be understood as a mosaic of national spaces validated by immutable ethnic or national communities fully conscious of their distinct character. Unlike interwar Balkanology, 
its post-war continuation never went as far as to interrogate the basic theoretical premise of the discipline, the construction of boundaries per se. Overall, Balkan studies remained isolated from the theoretical and methodological debates taking place since the 1970s in general history and the social sciences, especially in political economy and nationalism studies in both Western and Eastern Europe. Finally, the post-1989 period has been characterized by a theoretical clash over the meaning of the Balkans. In reaction to the revived discourse of Balkanism in the wake of the Yugoslav Wars, some scholars, coming mainly from the literary and cultural studies, sought to argue for the Balkans not as a product of geography, history or culture, but as a place in a discourse geography. A great deal of the research after the mid-1990s has centered around the nature of this discourse, how it was established, its characteristics, and its critique. But there are also those who have continued the search for the historical or cultural reality of the Balkans, variously defined in terms of cluster of structural and cultural characteristics or historical legacies. The theoretical discussions the Balkans gave rise to place the area in the center of the debates on the meaning of regions and the mechanisms for the production of space <coughs> that has led to interrogating definitions, traits, and boundaries. In his How to Write History, Paul Vane quotes geographer Schmidthammer, saying that to want to find the real regions is to want to square the circle. This vain comments does not mean that the concept of region is a mere fancy, but that regions are a question of point of view. Regions are, therefore, an imminently controversial and contested concept, the scientific definition of which has caused many problems for those trying to have their regional schemes accepted is more valid than others. So what can we actually learn from the Balkan case about the production of regions themselves? and the production of regions itself. The, the entanglement of politics with scholarship appears as a major propeller of region making. The politicization of scholarly regionalisms related to, on one hand, the great European state's economic and political interests in this area, and on the other, various local nationalist or federalist schemes <coughs> typically conceived in response to external or domestic political pressure. Balkan regionalist projects were steeped in diametrically opposed value systems. Conservative, national liberal, Marxist, social constructivist, etc. When we talk about supranational frameworks, we tend to believe that we are referring to polit politically progressive projects. Many regional schemes, however, spoke on behalf of far more ambiguous political stances. Consequently, the Balkans could be referred to as the root of European civilization or be envisaged as the driver of an alternative anti-European value system. It could signify a younger Europe which would revitalize the old one or represent a stigmatizing notion denoting deficiency in civilizational terms to be overcome by consistent efforts at Europeanization. Yet the most enduring source of politicization of scholarly regional terminology is the fusion of regionalist and nationalist designs in the fields of politics, the economy, and culture. The academic notion of the Balkans was construed in dialogue with national autarky and nation-centered scholarly paradigms. The outcome was patently ambivalent. The drive for methodological rescaling beyond the national often originated from essentially nationalist agendas. There is indeed no clear-cut difference, but a complex relationship between the conceptualizations of the national and the regional. Nationalist arguments may be adduced to buttress a regionalist framework, and a regional definition may serve, may serve to bolster a nationalist project. Local regionalizations, sometimes connected to and at other times 
clashed with the regional discourses produced outside the region. To put it bluntly, as powerful as the post-Enlightenment Western discourse, or rather different national Western discourses of the European East and South East might have been, it was neither the sole nor at all times the dominant <coughs> agent of regionalization. As I tried to indicate, if only sketchily, the flow of ideas, concepts, and narratives was never unidirectional. The ideas of scholars like Shishmanov, Tzvich, Yorga, Papakostya, Budimir, and Skok strongly influenced Western conceptualizations. Sometimes they went beyond the, under, the understanding of the Balkans. Tzvich's influence is clearly attestable in both Fernand Brudel's conceptualization of the Mediterranean and the paradigm of histoire de mentalité. Jorge partook in both Karl Lamprecht's projects of Weltgeschichte and the new cultural history that prepared the ground for the Annal School. Such cases of knowledge transfer bespeak a movement of concepts and ideas that, although being asymmetrical, breaches the rampant view of a monodimensional West to East pattern. The Balkan case is also revealing of the way various disciplines are contributing to the production and life cycle of regions. Until World War II, linguist, linguistics, folklore, literature, and ethnography were much more important than history proper for the crystallization of the Balkans as a historical region. The upsurge of the social sciences and of divisions based on socioeconomic and political models after 1945 to a large extent subsume South Southeastern Europe and the Balkans under the East European umbrella, undermining the Balkan narrative, which, however, re-emerged with the cultural turn in the 1980s. The recurrent and currently prevailing notion of the Balkans as based on the continuity of its history springs from the assumption that shared historical experiences within this geographical space necessarily produce a structural entity, a historical region, and even sometimes like something like regional identity. However, none of the regional historical experiences and legacies was exclusively a Balkan one, as they typically applied to much bigger political configurations, nor did they affect this geographical space as a whole and in the same degree. A closer look at individual historical periods suggests that most of the so-called defining characteristics of the region were not incomparable with other regions in Europe and beyond it. Furthermore, social and demographic, religious, cultural and intellectual, economic or political phenomena draw different lines, shape different zones and render different <coughs> regional definitions. Diverging geographies also result from zooming differences. Areas charted by criteria on the micro level, like marriage or hereditary patterns, gender relations, household and work organizations, etc., differ from those drawn on a macro level, state building, industrialization, urbanization, etc. There is thus no single shared history that scholars can reify one that might be thought to produce a specific cluster of characteristics that could legitimately serve to construct a region. Instead, all histories encompass multiple geographies. Conversely, tailoring academic research to established spatial categories tends to predetermine to a large extent its conclusions. The endless debates about the boundaries of the Balkans have been the result of not only differing political agendas or, or geographic determinism, but of the scholarly fallacy of projecting a spatial category coined at a particular time and for particular purposes, backwards and forwards in time, in time where it sits uneasily with very different political realities. Such challenges to the meaning of regions and the legitimacy of various studies, feeding as they are on post-colonial critique, sensibilities attuned to an increasingly globalized world, and new theories related to the social construction of space, inevitably raises hard question, 
questions about the rationale and future of regional research. I have to necessarily leave the tackling of these issues for another occasion, but let me say now the following. Regions have not been overcome or made irrelevant by the demise of traditional area studies and the rise of the new transnationalism. However, sustaining their relevance as a terrain of action and an object of study entails reconfiguring their meaning. A vessel-like concept of a historical region marked by objective criteria, a cluster of structural and cultural traits, or even legacies, should recede before a fuzzier, processual, and open-ended one. This means shifting the focus of discussion to the social, political, and intellectual mechanisms affecting the materialization of space and borders, and most prominently, prominently to human agency. By our time, rage to deconstruct has given way to a fuller and richer exploration of the capacity and its limits of people and things to act. This most surely concerns academics and foregrounds the inherent politics of scholarly conceptualizations. Academic discourses are a powerful social mechanism for constructing space, whereby heuristic frameworks tend to crystallize into cognitive maps and political realities. If anything, academic volcanism teaches us as scholars to appreciate the fragility, transience, and fuzziness of our units of analysis and comparison and sharpen our sensitivity as well as responsibility to the spatial categories we are using. Thank you very much.